crystal and water keeps coming. Oh golly, where did I grow up? Some people would say I still haven't grown up. <laughs> um, I don't really want to grow up. <laughs> I think, um, gosh, childlike curiosity is what we all want to maintain, right? I think, um, let's see, the short version is that I was born in Boston. Uh, my, I was adopted by wonderful parents who, uh, my mother's a teacher, my father's a Navy pilot, so a little bit of the adventure daredevil plus the love of learning. And uh, I was actually born here in Boston. From here, uh, at about age one, we moved to California, then to Key West, Florida, then to Keflavik, Iceland. Uh, I also had a stop for a few months in South Carolina, went back down, lived in Atlanta, Georgia, and then I came um, to work in New Jersey at AT&T Bell Labs, and then came back to Boston uh, to be a student at MIT. So I've come full circle now. High school, I was interested in boys. <laughs> I was interested in skydiving and cutting out of classes. I'm not really good. I actually went to a public school. We were ranked 49th in the nation at the time, and it was not a very good school. I had a great English teacher um, and a great Shakespeare teacher. Uh, our science really needed a lot more help. Um, I couldn't get my science questions answered. I finally sort of bailed out. I found a science center nearby that would take me a couple afternoons a week to do electronics for fun. Oh, so I went over there and built the flip flops and fun stuff. I thought that was cool. I wanted to learn more about science, but we didn't really have much supporting it in my high school. Uh, so mostly I got the humanities. I got typing because they told me that all girls should learn to type so that if someday I had to work, I could be a secretary. Um, <laughs> this is the culture that I grew up in. Yeah, I am a very fast typist now. Uh, it, it turned out to be a useful skill, but I also sort of finished the typing course in a few weeks and had the rest of the semester. So I got to um, basically get permission to leave school and go off to the science center where I learned to um, build things. I remember one day driving home with a laser and a whole bunch of electronics in the front seat of the car and I had my parachute in the back and I had saved up my money and bought this little car. And I just felt like the luckiest girl in the world. I could drive anywhere in the world. I have my own car, I have my parachute, I have my cool electronics stuff. And I thought I was on top of the world. Um, I, my mom had a friend who did career counseling who gave me a whole bunch of tests that showed that I would probably never be a very good proofreader secretary, <laughs> um, but that I had an aptitude for science and engineering. I was always very good at math. Uh, and so I um, decided to go to Georgia Tech and study oh. engineering. And there I was torn because I loved architecture. I, was, I, I loved design. I loved to draw. I was, my mom was also very artistic. And I thought I should maybe study architecture, but I also loved physics. I thought maybe I should study physics. Um, but then I thought, man, I have to pay my bills and <laughs> get to school uh, and you know, get a job. And I heard engineers had the best starting salaries. And electrical engineering, I could learn about a lot of things I love too. So I studied electrical engineering. So after Georgia Tech, I was interested in uh, going to get a master's. I wasn't sure if I wanted to do a PhD. I was only kind of learning about advanced degree stuff um, later in college. It's funny, I got here and I met someone who said she'd wanted her PhD since she was in kindergarten. And I'm like, I never knew what a PhD was until I heard it like in a <laughs> song, you know, in high school. Um, but I was um, uh, interested in learning more about signal processing computer architectures. I wanted to design computer chips. And I went to Bell Labs to design uh, digital signal processing chips, the chips that allow you to do really high-speed real-time processing of speech signals and you know, all of the, uh, back then it was mostly speech, but we were starting to do more computer vision, you know, high-speed signal processing to perceive real-time information from people. So I was working in the chip design group at Bell Labs designing really cool new computer architectures. And then I came to MIT to do that too, to design architectures and algorithms to run on them. Uh, and my advisor here, Bruce Musicus, said to me one day, well, Roz, this is a really cool architecture you've designed. I'd come in with, you know, um, but what runs on it? Like, you, it's okay if you have a really amazing computer architecture, but if it doesn't, like, solve a real world problem better than some other architecture, like, it's not really better. So I thought, I think some ways the brain processes information would run better on this. Um, so I decided I need to learn how the brain worked. So I went off to the library. <laughs> I spent a lot of time in the library. Um, I would just read from left to right, top to bottom, everything I'd get my hands on. And uh, I would literally like move into the library you know, and do this all day. Um, so I decided to start learning all about how the brain sees information. And from there, 
Um, I, I finished my master's here, went back to Bell Labs, worked on new kinds of architectures for image compression, image coding, uh, contributed to the JPEG standard at the time, date myself here, uh, and then um, came back here to do my PhD. He's a little ingrown, I have to critique us. Um, we tend to hire a lot of our own. I did at least switch labs. You know, I went from that side of the campus to this side of the campus when I joined the faculty. Uh, the last year of my PhD, ironically, I, I didn't really want to work on media and television and stuff. And my advisor that was not in the media lab inherited all this media lab TV work and asked me to work on that. And I said, gee, you know, I prefer to do my statistical physics models of pattern processing that I think are kind of inspired by a lot of nature and um, how nature does design. And I wanted to work on those. Meanwhile, the Media Lab had hired Sandy Pentland, who was really interested in that stuff. So ironically, I moved in my last year of my PhD to the Media Lab to avoid doing media work. That was in the um, early 90s. Uh, I'm trying to remember exactly. I think it was around 93, 94 that I started. I, I remember it kind of started when I was reading uh, Richard Seidowitz's book, Synesthesia, The Man Who Tasted Shapes. Uh, I don't know if you know about synesthesia. Richard was writing about uh, a dinner guest who had come in his kitchen and, um, oh, I guess he'd gone to his house. So the, the man was tasting the soup and he said there aren't enough points on the chicken <laughs> or something like that. And Richard was like, what? He's a neurologist. And they got to talking and he discovered that this man feels shapes in his, when he experiences certain tastes. He tasted shapes. He also discovered that the effect was enhanced by alcohol, suppressed by caffeine, suggesting it was a little more subcortical than cortical. Long story, you know, fast forward, um, different kinds of brain imaging and so forth. Richard, uh, you know, argued that synesthetic experiences, whether they were colors and letters, which is the most common, or, you know, tastes and shapes, uh, or sounds and colors, um, supposedly Kandinsky was synesthetic, uh, that these were not happening in the cortex where we thought of most of perception as happening, but they were actually um, happening with heightened blood flow in subcortical regions. Okay. And I thought, hmm, that's funny. I had been studying all this signal processing in the brain about vision, audition. It was visual cortex, it was auditory cortex, it was all cortical. Why suddenly were perceptual things not happening in the cortex? They were happening somewhere else. I got, I got to go learn about these other regions. Um, well, he said these other regions are important for memory, emotion, and attention. And I'm like, well, I'm definitely not interested in emotion. <laughs> but memory and attention are interesting, right? I, look, I'm a woman in science. I am not touching emotion. So I thought, OK, memory and attention, i got to learn more about this. So I started learning about all these subcortical regions in the brain, and I kept bumping into emotion, which was really annoying, right? I do not want to touch emotion, right? How to throw away your career in one easy step. So I, uh, but I kept reading, and the data was leading me there. So this. You know, I always, I, I do believe that the world is structured and ordered, and that's why science can lead us to knowledge that makes sense. Um, and there, I believe that, yeah, I don't have perfect truth, but I do believe it's out there that we can start to discover pieces of it. And as I was discovering all of this converging evidence for emotion playing important roles in the brain, um, based on lots of neuroscience and other findings, uh, I realized that in AI and in all the work we were doing, um, that the functions emotion was performing were functions we were trying to perform without emotion. And maybe if we understood more how they worked in the human brain, it would help AI overcome a lot of the limits that it's been up against. So I faced this dilemma. Do I you know, muddy my name by dealing with emotion? Or, or do I keep ignoring what the evidence is saying and just do what everybody in my field is doing? And you decided to be rogue. You decided to go into you know, this this was about the time that Nicholas Negroponte, who's just so inspirational, um, was saying we need to, you know, young faculty should take risks. And, you know, we need to be, you know, developing the next new thing. And I wasn't sure at all this was going to be the next new thing. This could just get me laughed off stage. Um, but I remember once I was out to lunch with Jerry Wiesner, uh, whom this building, you know, the original Media Lab building is named after. And Jerry, I was asking Jerry, you know, Jerry, what's your advice for somebody like me, you know, new faculty here, engineer, now in our School of Architecture. Um, there's so much I could do and I want to do. What do you think is most important that somebody like me should be thinking about? And he 
took a bite of his bonbon, <laughs> you know, and he said, um, you must take risks. Junior faculty should be taking risks. And I realized the work I was doing right then, which was all this image analysis, content-based retrieval, you know, teaching the computer to recognize when Jerry Seinfeld walked into the video shot, you know. Um, while that was cutting edge, okay, and I was, you know, one of, like, the lead of one of three groups doing this, um, and in the world we were, you know, keynoting at all the conferences on it, we were getting the most cited publications, it was growing into a big area. I had just raised a half million dollars in funding in that area for that year. It was really a booming area, but it wasn't a high-risk area. It was like a guaranteed success area, right? It was taking off. You know, the planes were lining up. Um, it wasn't a big risk. Yeah, it was exciting. It's pretty much what my tenure was built on, but it wasn't a big risk. So in the last year before tenure, I decided after a bike ride with Peter Hart, of all people, of old La Honda Road and Silicon Valley, you know, when I'm like, a heap of sweat laying there going, ah, oh, Peter, I'm about to die. He's like, Roz, tell me more about this affective computing stuff. And I told him about it, and he said, Roz, you should stop all this other stuff you're doing and really, you know, put your energy into that. Now, Peter, you may not know, had written the most successful pattern recognition book in the field. It's still one of the most successful books of all time in pattern recognition, Duda and Hart, now Duda, Hart, and Stork. Um, extremely well-respected guy. I had enormous, I still have enormous respect for him. Uh, and I would not have expected him to suggest that I veer off of this, you know, classic, solid, mathematical, robust, high integrity research to this wacky world of, oh my gosh, I'm going to be associated with emotion. Like, how awful is that? Especially as I start reading that literature, and it's a mess, you know. There was, you know, it really needed a lot of um, fixing, I think. Um, there's some great stuff, but there's also a lot of stuff that does not meet the standards of a MIT engineer. So I, um, you know, between Nicholas and Jerry and Peter's uh, encouragement, I thought, okay, you know, I really think somebody needs to move into this stuff. So then I decided to try to get other people to do it. <laughs> I remember trying to talk several guys into doing it, like, because you don't want a woman no, doing emotion somebody, research. Yeah. No, there were some other, like, male researchers out there. Yeah. I'm like, you, you should do this. You've got something kind of in this area. And they were like, I'm not touching that. <laughs> um, you know, and honestly, in, like, in all my MIT years, I don't remember ever being so nervous giving a talk as my first talk on affective computing, even to a group of friends here. I just thought, oh, dear. Crystal and water keeps coming and going. In a stream of wonders, it follows me. Splashes into me. 